Hi, my name is Tian Gildenhuis, and I want to speak to you about a thing we call house cleaning or spiritual house cleaning. But before we proceed, let's pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name in this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we know that you came to earth to teach us about your love and about your authority, about your kingdom here on earth, that we may rule on this earth. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you will bless these people watching this DVD, that your Holy Spirit will open hearts, because Lord Jesus, when you died on that cross, you said I came to set the captives free. And I pray that you will free people today after watching this DVD, free them from bondages in their homes, so that they will realize it's all about obedience to your word. And thank you, Lord Jesus, when you died, you went up to heaven and you sat at the right hand of God and you sent us the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here today. You are welcome in the studio and you are welcome in every home that is watching this DVD. And I pray that you will convict of sin, righteousness and judgment. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you do give us the authority to say to Satan, Satan, you and your demons have no legal right in this studio or in any home watching this DVD. And you will listen when these people take up their authority in Christ and you will leave from homes in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. If it wasn't for the blood, Lord Jesus, we wouldn't have been here. And I pray that you will cover us now in your blood, that the angels who are ministering spirits for us will be around this place and will be around every home watching this DVD so that you may be glorified. Because Lord Jesus, it's all about you. We thank you in your holy name. Amen. People, what I want to discuss with you today is spiritual house cleaning. About the fact that we can bring things into our homes that give a legal right to demon spirits to attack us or our children. And it is very controversial, I know. And Satan ensures that it does stay controversial because he has come to steal, kill and destroy, remember? That's what the Bible tells us in John 10 verse 10. So you must remember, we must read the Bible and be obedient to the word of God as it is written. There are about 31,000 verses in the Bible, people. And we have one of two choices to make. Is the whole Bible applicable to me today or only sections? Because the moment that I decide that only sections are applicable to me, that means nothing is applicable to me. Because how can I decide which sections are applicable to me today and which not? No, people, I believe the Bible from Genesis 1 verse 1 to Revelation 22 verse 21 in the fact that it is the written, God of, uh, written word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, according to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. I believe every word that is written in it. And I want to be obedient to every word. And there is a text that I want you to remember. And I will start with that. And that is in Isaiah 28 verse 9 and 10, which says, To whom does he want to teach knowledge and open the revelations? To those that are weaned from the breasts, that are taken away from the mother's milk, and then verse 10 says, For it is precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. How does God want to teach us knowledge? And how does He want to reveal the revelations to us? Line upon line, line upon line. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. So that's how much patience He has towards us. Now many people say to me, No, Tian, we must read the Bible in context. Yes, we must read the Bible in context. But the moment that you finish reading a paragraph or a chapter in context, you go back and you say, Holy Spirit, please now reveal this to me. Reveal this chapter to me, line upon line, precept upon precept, line upon line, so that I can understand how is it applicable to me today. And the picture that we are showing you now, they are all idols, people. They are all idols being worshipped in some culture, some country, or in some organizations where they are being honored, or idolized. And we will have to see what the Word of God says about this. But all these pictures that I've just shown you now come from the same background, from the father of lies, Satan, the kingdom of darkness. And remember, people, God says, I'm a jealous God. You're my children. I died for you on that cross. I bought you expensively with my blood. I don't share you with the kingdom of darkness. I want you to be obedient to my word. Line upon line, line upon line. There's another verse that I want you to remember. It's 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13 that says, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. Some other translations put it like this. For we write none other things to you than what you read or understand. And I trust that you will understand them to the end. So if the Bible says our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenlies. What does it mean? 
exactly that. If the Bible says earth was made in six days, what does it mean? Exactly that. It does not mean anything else. This is the way I believe my Father's word. This is the way He's opened it to me. And this is the way He's leading us every day. So let's see what Exodus says about this whole aspect. In Exodus 20 verse 2 and 3 we read, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now remember in today, in the terms that we use in this day, Egypt is just a symbol of the world. So God says to you, child of God, I'm still the Lord your God, who brought you out of the world and out of the house of bondage. And the next verse says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Read that again. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It does not say anything else but possession. Thou shalt not possess any other gods before me, because I'm still a jealous God. So we must remember that, people. So many people say to me, but no, Tian, I'm not bowing down before this thing. That's not what that line says. That line says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So if I do have other gods in my house, I am disobedient to God's word. And if I'm disobedient to God's word, I'm obedient to who? I just have one other choice, Satan. And of course he wants us to be obedient to him. Because if we are obedient to him, that gives him a legal entry into my house. A legal way to come and attack my people. So many people say to me, but Tian, that is out of the law. We are not bound by the law anymore. We've been made free of the law. And then I always ask the question, is that a fact? Were we so made free of the law, does it now mean because I'm free of the law, I can commit murder? Because now we are free of the law, can I uh, cover my neighbor's wife? No, people. We've been made free from the curse of the law. The law has now been written on our hearts. It is not something, a rod that can hit us over the head anymore. This is now a relationship. I'm now in a relationship with my heavenly father. And my relationship brings me to the point that I say, Lord, I want to be obedient to your word, line upon line, line upon line. Because I know, Lord, you haven't changed yet. Because so many people ask me, but Tian, hasn't the Lord changed his mind about this? No. If we look at Psalm 102 verse 27, we see it says, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. So God has not changed yet. Another verse, Malachi 3 verse 6, says, For I am the Lord, I change not. And then a very well-known verse in Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So if God told his children yesterday, thou shalt have no other gods before me, he's telling the same thing to his children today, and he will tell the same thing to his children until the day that he comes. Why? Because idols are from Satan. Idols can pull you away from God. And I know immediately you're thinking, but Tian, I'm not an idol worshiper. Just go through this DVD with me. Let's just proceed. Just give me some time. And let the Holy Spirit of the Lord speak into your heart about idols that you've brought into your home. I see in the following verse that we're reading in Joshua 24, verse 21 to 24, it's just before Joshua died. Now, keep this in mind, people. This is before Joshua died. This is now after the people have been walking in the desert for 40 years. After having entered the promised land. In other words, they saw all the miracles and wonders of God for 40 years in the desert. They saw the prophecy being fulfilled that they got the promised land. And then just before Joshua dies, he speaks to them and he says to them, how are you going to follow the Lord when I'm not here? This is now in my own translation. But listen to what the Bible says, what the people said. And the people said unto Joshua, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. So dear friend, sitting outside, watching this DVD, have you also said, I will serve the Lord? Have you also made that decision yet? If so, today you are a witness against yourself before the Lord Jesus that you have chosen God to serve him. And just look what Joshua then tells the people in the next verse. Again, remember, they've been 
walking the road with God for 40 years. They saw his miracles. They saw his power. They saw the prophecies being fulfilled. And yet, the following thing that Joshua tells them after they proclaim with their mouths, we will follow the Lord, he says, now therefore, put away, the dictionary gives those words, put away as remove or be without. Now therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you. And incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and His voice we will obey. People, this means that you can also walk the road with God for 40 years. You can also be a churchgoer for 40 years and still have strange gods in your house that you don't even know about. Or that maybe you do know about, but you say, mm, This can do me nothing. This doesn't mean anything to me. The question you have to ask is not about does it mean anything to you, but does it mean anything to God? Because it's not about you and I, you see. It's about God. So we must put away all the idols. We must remove them, be without them. And then we look at Psalms 96 verse 4. That says, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Just look at that. All the gods of the nations are idols. There is not one excluded. We can't say, okay, this actually says all the gods of the nations except those of the Buddhists, all the gods of the nations except those of the Hindus are idols. No, this very clearly says for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So there's no idol, no image that you may have in your house that is an idol in another uh, uh, country or in another culture that is not an idol in God's eyes. Not in your eyes or my eyes or in people's eyes, in God's eyes. Psalm 16 verse 4 says, Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. And therefore will I not take up their names into my lips. I come to so many people and they tell me, Tian, I don't know what's going on in my house because it's darkness in my marriage, in the lives of my children, in my finances. We can't break through what's going on. And then I walk into the house and I see some Buddha statuettes and I see some African art and I see some Eastern uh, cultural things hanging around and I say, that's your problem. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. And then the people always say, but Tian, I didn't hasten after that God. I say, really? How much in a hurry were you to also buy yourself a Buddha just because your friend has one, just because your mother has one, just because somebody else has one? How much haste did you have to buy that other God? Because that is an image of a God. You see, in another culture. And remember, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't ask yourself then, why do I have so many sorrows? Because the Bible said, your sorrows will be multiplied if you hasten after another God. Now let's look at another two verses. Deuteronomy 18 verse 9 which states, when thou art come into the land, into the land, or into the business, or into the home, or into the farm, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. You see, God does not want us, want us to learn the ways of the heathen nations. He wants us as his children, as his spiritual children, to be pure and free before him to be cleansed of anything that's not from him. And so many people say, Tian, but that's only one verse. Well, yes, but the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, something will be so. It will be fixed. So let's say Deuteronomy 18 verse 9 is my first witness. Then my second witness is the following verse, Jeremiah 10 verse 2. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith who? Thus saith the Lord. Learn not the way of the heathen. And people, I will show you today. How many of the heathen's ways did we learn as Christians? And remember now, if the Bible says learn not the way of the heathen, and we did learn the way of the heathen, and we're following the way of the heathen, who are we obedient to then? To Satan, not to God. So let's get back, Christians. Let's get back to the place where we are obedient to God's word, line upon line, precept upon precept, everything as it is written in the Bible. Then we look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 25 to 26 which says, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee. Why? Because the following part says, lest 
thou be snared therein. You see, people, God knew 4,000 years ago approximately that his children can be snared by the graven Im images of other gods, of other nations' gods. And he's telling you the same thing today. My child, you can still be snared by the graven images of other gods. Let's proceed with this verse. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. To whom? To the Lord thy God. So many people say, Tian, that thing doesn't bother me. It's not about you. Does it bother God? Because in his eyes, an idol is an abomination. We've just read it. Then it proceeds to say, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house. Why? Lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Can you see? You will become cursed if you bring that thing into your house. The Bible says so. Why do you become cursed? Is it God cursing you? No. It is Satan getting a legal right to come and attack you because you are disobedient to God's word. Now if we go back to the first section of this verse, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Just read that with me. Shall ye burn with fire. I come into many homes and then people say to me, No, but Tian, I am a Holy Spirit full child of God. I just anointed that thing hanging on my wall and I broke any curses over it. Now I'm fine. Is that what it says? Let's read that part again. The graven images of their gods you may anoint. No, that's not what it says. It says the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. That's what the Bible says. And if I want to be obedient to the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, I will burn them with fire because I am now in a relationship with my heavenly Father. And I say, Father, everywhere you say you shall burn has become to me because the law is now on my heart has become to me. I want to burn. I'm not legalistic. I'm in a relationship now. A relationship that wants to please my heavenly Father. A relationship that wants to do everything that pleases Him. A friend of mine always says, if a snake comes sailing into the studio now, and I give Conrad at the back there some of my anointing oil, and I say, please, Conrad, anoint that thing for me. What is it now? It is still a snake. It's just an oiled snake. It's just an anointed snake. It still has the potential to do me harm. That's the same thing with the things that we bring into our homes. It is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now we look at Isaiah 30, verse 21 to 23. And it states, And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. And I pray today that the Holy Spirit will use my voice. If you may have turned to the wrong side concerning things in your homes over the past couple of years, that this voice will be the one telling you, this is the way, walk in this way. And then we look at the following verse, verse 23, it says, Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver, and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. You see, people, what, was, what must we do with those idols? We must get rid of them. Why? Because we have a promise in verse 23. In verse 23, we read the following. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground withal, and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. Can you see? When will God give rain? Only after you have defiled the covering of the graven images of silver and the ornaments of gold. Only after you have cast them away, only after you have told them, get thee hence, only then shall he give the rain on thy seed. I get so many Christians asking me, Tian, what's happening in our homes? What's happening in my life? Because we give our tithes to the scent. We sow, but we reap nothing. Nothing is growing. Nothing is growing spiritually in our lives. Nothing is growing financially in our lives. Nothing is going on. What's going on? Then I tell them, look at this. It says here, You've got ornaments and images in your house that are idols. And God cannot give the rain on the seed you have sown until you have defiled those idols, until you have cast them away and told them, get thee hence. So I pray really that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you today 
Which things are not allowed in your home? Which things will you not bring into your house ever again? Because after today, you have certain knowledge. The question is, what are you going to do with that knowledge? That is your decision. It's not mine. You see, God himself can convict. Only the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I cannot convict you of anything, my friend. I cannot convince you of anything, and I'm not trying to. I'm just going to show you what the Lord has revealed to me, and I'm going to share, you with, share with you some testimonies that we've received around the country in South Africa and also around the world about what has happened to people after they took away these idols, after they cleaned their homes. So many people say to me, Tian, there is no connection between an idol and a spirit or a demon spirit. Let's look at Revelations 9, verse 20 and 21, that is shown to you now. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils. Another translation says demons. And idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. You see, there is a definite, definite connection to sin, a demon spirit and an idol. The following verse is Deuteronomy 32, verse 16 and 17, that says, They provoked him, this is now God, to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, again unto demons, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And today on this DVD, I will show you new gods that came newly up. You see, because what happens? Satan ensures that the moment that Christians find out that certain things are idols, there are new ones coming in, new ones coming in, new ones coming in, every time. And in that way, he tries to trip us up. And we must have that discernment, and we must ask the Holy Spirit to give us the discernment to know what's going on. You see, people, a while ago, I ministered at a, a, a missionary conference in, in South Africa, and a friend of mine gave me a few minutes to speak to people about this. And there were pastors there from Ghana and Rwanda and the Sudan, black pastors. And I spoke about these things, and I specifically referred to African art, to African masks and, and, and the little men that are being carved and all that. And when I'd spoken about this and what the Lord says, all these verses that I've just given you, one pastor from Ghana got up and he said, can I speak, please? And they said, yes, please come forward. And he said, I just want to confirm everything this man has just said. I used to be an idol worshiper before coming into ministry, and, I, and he's now been in ministry for 20 years. He said, but I tell you today that when you bring an artifact, and he was specifically also referring to African artifacts, when you bring an artifact into your home, it is not just an idol. It is an altar where the demons can come and feed in your house. You see, people, those people coming from that kind of background who knows the spiritual realm from the darkness side, no, this is a truth, that there is a connection between the idol and a demon spirit. We have another uh, testimony about people going to Taiwan or Taipei, to one of the huge Buddhist temples there with that big Buddha sitting there. But behind the Buddha, there was a hole in the wall. And these people were Christians. And this one Christian said to the guide, what is that hole in the wall behind that idol? And the Guide says, that is the hole where the spirit lives that guards the statue. You see, people, those people know there is a connection between the statue or the statuette and a spirit. Satan ensures that we Christians who do not have this kind of knowledge just argue with each other. We argue out of a position of not having any knowledge. And we think we are so clever. And Satan laughs at us. Satan keeps us ineffective in the kingdom of God. Deuteronomy 23 verse 14 gives us a very clear warning. Just listen to this. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. Now in your instance, that is your house or your business or your farm, whatever. To deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Who are our enemies today? We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenlies. Those are our enemies today, not flesh and blood. So God says, my child, I want to free you and to give up those enemies to you so that you can be free from them. But let's proceed. Therefore shall thy camp, thy house, thy business, thy farm, be holy so that he, God, 
shall see no unclean thing in, or an, another translation says, among thee, and turn away from thee. What does this, this say to me? God says, I'm walking in your house, my child. But I see certain things in your house that is not from me. I see certain things in your home that is from the kingdom of darkness. My child, your home is not holy. My Bible says, I have to turn away from thee. I have to take away my protection from you, from you while you have things there that is not from me. You see, my child, if you cannot be true to my word, I'm always true to my own word. You see, God is always. That's one thing God cannot do. He cannot go against his own word. He's true to his own word. So people, I get to houses and then people say to me, Tian, I don't know what's going on. We pray the blood of Jesus over our houses every day. We pray the angels to be around our homes. But they break in every month. And they steal our stuff and they rob us. What's going on? Then I walk in and I see these Buddha statuettes and Eastern stuff and African art. And I say, people, that's your problem. The Bible says the Lord will turn away from you if you have things that is unclean in His eyes. That's what's happening there. So the angels were not there, even though you pray them. Does it mean you're not a child of God anymore? Oh, yes, you're still his child. He still wants to protect you, but he wants you to be obedient to his word. You see, he does not change. He's God. He's our king. He's our father. We are the ones that are supposed to change. We must not conform to this world, Romans 12 verse 2. We must be like Jesus. We must be obedient to Jesus. It's all about Jesus, not about any one of us. Jesus the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Yeshua HaMashiach. Have you met him yet, friend? If not, we will have a prayer at the, right at the end of this DVD, which will give you the chance to pray that prayer that will roll at the back, and you can read it, and you can pray that prayer, and just bring him into your life. Get Jesus Christ into your life, and you will see how the Holy Spirit will start to reveal things like this to you. And again, people say, but this is just only one verse. This is just one witness Okay, let's bring in the second witness, the second verse, confirming this fact that God says he will turn away. Joshua 7, verse 11 to 13. I give you the background. The, the people are standing uh, next to Jericho. And God says, when these walls of Jericho fall, you will not take anything inside there. And then the walls fall down. And what happens? Achan, one man, goes and he takes himself a robe and some gold and some silver. Is it idols that he's taking? No, he takes in disobedience to God's instruction. So if we say, the Lord has said, you shall have no other gods before me and I have other gods, I'm disobedient to the Lord's instruction. So what happens in this instance? In this instance, the people go into a war at a place called Ai and they lose. 36 people die and Joshua goes on his face before the Lord and says, Lord, what's going, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord says, look at what we're showing you now on the, on the screen. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and they have put it even among their own stuff. What I want you to realize here, only one man has taken. God says, Israel has sinned. Now people, there were anything between 600,000 and 3 million people in that desert at that time. Only one man takes, but in God's eyes, the whole nation of Israel has sinned. What does that mean to you and me? If I live in a house with my children or with my parents or with my brother and sister and my son or my daughter or my parents or my brother brings something into my home that is from the kingdom of darkness, that means in God's eyes, it's not just my brother sinning or my son sinning or my daughter sinning. Then in God's eyes, my whole house has already sinned. You see, because we don't have the guts anymore to say, no, you will not bring that thing into my house. Because we are so afraid that my little three-year-old daughter or my little three-year-old son will throw a tantrum. You see, because Satan ensured that discipline, the biblical discipline that the Bible teaches us about, is taken out of homes, taken out of schools, taken out of government, taken out of the church. Discipline is a part of our biblical teachings. It's a part of what Jesus taught us. We must be disciplined. How do we discipline somebody? The relationship we have. The relationship brings that discipline. But let's look at this still more. And I'm asking you now, how many of you have taken accursed things and put it among your own stuff? Unknowingly, but after today, you will not say, I didn't know. Because after today, you do have knowledge. 
After today, you won't be able to stand before God's throne one day and say, Lord, I did not know about those things. Because he will remind you about this DVD. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before the enemies, but turned their backs before the enemies, because they were now accursed. And then the following verse is, Neither will I, this is now God speaking, Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves. You say, I told you, sanctification is not just about my life or my body. Sanctification is about my possessions as well. Listen to what God says. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou cannot stand before thine enemies, enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. You see? Do you realize now why all these things are maybe happening in your home, happening in your marriage, happening in your children's lives? Because you say, mm, that thing can't do me anything. That thing can't do me anything. I'm not buying myself before that thing, so it can't do me anything. In the meantime, you are not sanctified before the Lord. In the meantime, he says, I'm seeing things in your house that is not from me, that is accursed. And I will not be with you, my son, my daughter, until you take that away. Then we look at the following verse. Revelation 12 verse 9 and Revelation 20 verse 2 nearly states exactly the same thing. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now people, who's the dragon according to those verses? Satan, the devil. Now, if I have something depicting a dragon in my house, whether it is on my t-shirt or my shirt or um, my pajamas or the videos that my little children watch, the animation videos that's got these cute little dragons flying around. Uh, who's that? What is that a depiction of? The devil and Satan. And do you think God is happy about us having depictions of the devil and of Satan in our homes? I don't think so. I don't think God wants that in our homes. I don't think so. I know that according to the verses that I've shown you up to now. But you see, people, we must realize one thing. Satan does not come to you with a red face and a red suit and a red fork. No. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed, another translation says, disguises himself, into an angel of light. He comes to you and your children cute. He comes to you and your children beautiful. Because he transforms himself into an angel of light. And therefore, verse 15 says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed or disguised as the ministers of righteousness. I get so many instances that people say to me, Tian, I don't understand one thing. My little boy or my little daughter, because people, you must understand, your children, three, four, five years old, their spirits are still open. That's why Satan tries to attack them there. We grown-ups... Our spirits have been cluttered over years by many things. But I get so many people coming to me saying, but my little boy or my little daughter has got an imaginary friend that only he can see, that only she can see. I can't see him. What's going on? Then I explain this to them. You see, your little boy or your little daughter plays with certain puppets or fairies or whatever. I'm going to speak about this later today. And what happens tonight at 12? Your son or your daughter wakes up and this fairy, let's say Tinkerbell, stands before him or her, life-size, saying, but I want to play with you. And what does your boy or girl say? Ooh, but I do play with you every day. There's your little puppet. I've got all your books. I've got all your videos. Please come into my life. Now, what is that? That is a demon spirit disguising himself as Tinkerbell. And it enters your son's life or your daughter's life. And suddenly there are these imaginary friends. And what happens now? These imaginary friends start pulling your children away from other friends. Start pulling your children away from you. Is that from God or from Satan? That's from Satan. I've got another testimony about a little child of two and a half years old who had an angel as a friend. The difference between the imaginary friends that the other children have, pulling them away from other friends, pulling them away from their parents, this angel taught this little girl songs about Jesus, things about her, what's happening in heaven, 
taught her playing trumpet or playing some other musical instruments, building her up, saving her life in one instance, with the mother driving down a road and the daughter suddenly screaming that the angel says we must stop at the, at the robot that was green and she stopped and a huge lorry came down across the red robot right in front of her and she said if she did not stop in that moment they would have been dead. You see, that is something totally different. That's from God. That's a messenger from God. That's an angel from God protecting the children because if you want to read Matthew 18 verse 10 you will see that your children do have guardian angels before the throne of the Lord every day. Read it for yourself in Matthew 18, verse 10. But you must remember now, the same thing happens with Satan teaching or sending his demon spirits into your children's lives and then pulling them away, pulling them away from other little friends, pulling them away from the family because he wants to kill them. Isaiah 5, verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Listen again. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. My friend, all these things that I'm showing you today will be evil. All these things that I'm showing you today is darkness. I'm not calling evil good today or good evil. I'm calling evil evil and darkness darkness. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak into your heart today, whether you may have been calling evil things good up to now whether you may have been calling darkness light up to now. And I pray that this will be revealed to you and that you will start to be taken off the mother's breast, that you will be weaned from the mother's milk, spiritual milk, and that you will start to eat spiritual steaks, that you will grow in the spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. What are we talking about now? Remember I said, woe unto thee? Let's look at the first one coming up on the screen now is mementos of previous affairs. And immediately when I say this, the women especially go up in arms. What is the problem with mementos of previous affairs? People, they bind you to the past. And what happens is, let's say you've got all these pictures of previous loves, previous lovers, previous friends, previous boyfriends, whatever the case may be, or even girlfriends, now I'm referring to the women, but also to the men. And what happens, let's say you've got a problem in your marriage. Things are not right between you and your husband or you and your wife. So what happens now? You open your mementos, you open the pictures of previous boyfriends, and you start paging through this, and you start to wonder what happened to Jerry that loved me so much. Maybe I should have married him and not Peter. So what's happening there? there's a shakiness coming into your marriage that's not supposed to be there. What is causing it? The mementos. Because if you did not have those mementos, you would not even remember what Jerry looked like. He would be out of the picture totally. And you would be able to ask the Lord to teach you to concentrate on your marriage, to teach you to become like Christ in your marriage, either as husband or as wife. To become like Christ toward each other. But you see, those mementos cause problems. And those mementos may be watches, those mementos may be rings, those mementos may be chains, or whatever the case may be. It may even be furniture. And it may cause problems. So people let the Holy Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord speak to you about this. The second one is pornography. People in pornography is a huge problem in a marriage. Pornography does not help you in your marriage. Pornography breaks up a marriage. So please, sir, please, madam, don't have any pornography in your home, not on your computer, not on videos, not in books, in any way. Because Satan uses his spirits of lust, adultery, and perversion to pull you away from a godly marriage through pornography. It does not help your marriage, so please get rid of that. Satan uses that as an opening to attack your marriage in your bed, in your marriage bed, in the marital bed. And you don't know what's going on. It's because there is a spirit of perversion lurking in your house, attaching to the pornographic material in your home. Get rid of that in the mighty name of Jesus. Videos, films, and computer games. People, the list is too long to even refer to any of them. But I tell you now, there may be 2% of all the new videos or films or computer games that is actually acceptable in God's eyes, that is watchable in the eyes of a Christian. The rest is either demon-infested, occultic, 
or straight from the pages of hell. And I tell you today, you must let the Holy Spirit of the Lord teach you about this, give you discernment about this. You don't have to go and watch the movie to find out whether there's a problem. Just look at the poster that they put up. Just look at the little slogan that they write at the bottom, then you know there's a problem. You don't have to watch it. You say, oh, but I have to see it to understand, to discern whether there's a problem. No, let the Holy Spirit of God let you discern before you go in there. Because you must protect your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says very clearly you must protect your heart. Because from this comes the origins of life. You see, we sow seed into our hearts through three ways. Through our eyes, through our ears, and through our mouths. What we watch sows seeds. If we watch horror movies, fear will grow in our lives. If we watch pornography, lust will grow in our lives, which is not from God. If we watch videos about the Bible, about the Word of God, if we, if we read the Word of God, that's the seed we sow into our hearts. That will then grow in our lives. But the videos that our children watch about witches, about uh, uh, demonic manifestations, about occultic stuff, all that, that's not from God. It pulls your child away from the truth of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who died for him on a cross. So please, I will refer to some videos and films. We have problems like, for example, in, in, in Lion King where Rafiki, the baboon, practices ancestral worship, where he practices magic and witchcraft and where he lets Simba speak to his dead father in the clouds. The Bible is very clear about necromancy. We will speak about this later. Now let's look at tarot and ordinary playing cards. We know that tarot cards are used to show the future or to forecast the future or whatever the case may be. That's divination, people. We know that's a problem. But what about ordinary playing cards? What's the problem with ordinary playing cards? Number one, on each and every satanistic altar, there is also a packet of ordinary playing cards because they are also used to practice divination with. But that's not you and your and my problem. Because, of course, we aren't Satanists, are we? We are Christians. But what are we playing with? You see, we have the following declaration by the Professional Gamblers Association of the World. And people, this is an official declaration. It's in their books. You can go and read it for yourself. You don't have to believe me. None of the stuff that we're showing you today, you have to believe me. You can go and read it for yourself. You will get it on the internet. You will get it all over in, in libraries and stuff. This is all available to the public. But you see, for so long, Satan has kept Christians from trying to get this kind of knowledge. Because Satan said to you, if you get this knowledge, you will be pulled away from God. No, 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 no. The Bible says, when you get spiritual knowledge, you will stay away from evil. That's what will happen when you get knowledge. Many of us who fought in wars or who were in the army, the first thing that they taught us in the army was what? Know your enemy. Now we are in the greatest spiritual war of all times that can uh, change the way we will spend eternity. And what do they teach us? You do not want to know your enemy. Does that make sense? Yes, to Satan it makes sense. Now from God's eyes, we must ensure that we have knowledge about the ways that the enemy attacks us. Now, the Professional Gamblers Association of the World has proclaimed that the king card, that cards do have a secret language. And in the secret language of cards, the king card represents Satan. The queen card is Mother Mary, Mary, but in the secret language of cards, she's the mother of harlots. The jack is the pimp. The pimp is the one giving the harlots work. And then the joker, the fool, is Jesus Christ. So in the secret language of cards, whether you play rummy, whether you play poker, whether you play blackjack, whether you play solitaire on your computer, whether you play whatever with cards, you are saying Satan is king, Jesus Christ is a fool. The choice is yours. Spider-Man, Batman, and the Hulk. What is the problem with Spider-Man? Huge problem. In South, A South Africa specifically, we have lots and lots of testimonies about children not wanting to sleep in their rooms, wetting their beds. And what happens? The moment that the parents take out the Spider-Man stuff, the Spider-Man clothes, the Spider-Man duvets, the Spider-Man little puppets, the problems are solved. You see, because in the spiritual realm, the meaning of the spider and the web on Spider-Man's breast is entrapment in the web of Satan. Snare, evil, sin, lies, fear, or deception. Those are all the meanings attached to that spider and the web. I have a specific testimony about a little boy of 10 years old who wet his bed, could not sleep in his room, fearful. And then the pastor of his church told his parents about Spider-Man and the father said, I don't believe you, but I'll test you. And he took out all the stuff from the boy's room for 10 days or something like that. 
And for 10 days, the boy slept in his room without wetting his bed, without fear, without any problem. After the 10 days, the father put back the stuff. On the first evening, the boy wet his bed and did not want to sleep in his room. Is that a coincidence? No, that's a God incidence. There's no such a thing as a coincidence. God shows us the true light, and we must start to walk in the true light of God. Also, with the toys that we buy our children. Batman. What is the problem with Batman? The bat on his chest refers to fear, flighty, unstable, and witchcraft. That's what it means. I have a specific testimony from a lady where I ministered once about this, and she said to me, ah, this does not bother me. I said, that's okay. It's for you to decide. She phones me two days later. She says, I want to apologize. I say, why? She says, because I've got a little grandson of four years old. Again, remember the age, three, four, five, three, four, five, four years old. He's a little angel. I went to pick him up from the pre-primary school today. When we got home, he said, Grandma, I want to put on my Batman suit. And she said, that's fine, you can do it. She says, and Tian, when he got out of his room, he was a little monster. He started shouting at each and every one of us. He started screaming, screaming at us. He was actually hissing like a snake at some stages. And then she said, I realized there's a problem about this. I said, lady, you've just been, this has just been revealed to you by God. You must now decide what are you going to do about that. The Hulk. What is the problem with the Hulk? The Hulk is a scientist. When he gets in some ke chemicals, he becomes a monster, killing and slaying and causing havoc. What is the problem now? Is this the way God wants us to be? Is this the way God wants us, our children to be? Because now we buy our little boys the duvet sets of the Hulk with this aggressive green face on the pillowcase. And my boy puts his head on a symbol of aggression every evening. And suddenly we find out at school, the teachers phone me, the principal phones me, and he says, we've got a problem with your son. He's very aggressive. So we send him to the psychologists, and we send him to the doctor, and we send him everywhere, but they can't find the problem, because the problem lies on his pillowcase. And you must understand me correctly today. I'm not saying that if your child does have a problem, just ha does have a problem with aggression or whatever, that the pillowcase is the only problem. There may be other factors involved as well that you must have, must look at. But you must also think about this. You must also keep this in mind as part of the possible problem in your child's life. Let the Holy Spirit of the Lord speak to you about this. War memorabilia. People, war memorabilia, and I'm specifically speaking about things having killed, having been used to kill other people's, other people or persons. You must remember, the spirits of death, of murder, of aggression, they want a place to stay in your home. And they use old sabers or guns or whatever that has been caused to kill other people to hang around in your home. I've come into a home that they say to me, Tian, we've all wanted to kill each other in this house already. We've all wanted to commit suicide. What's going on? And I walk into that house and I just see one saber that grandfather used in the Second World War to cut off people's heads. And I say to them, but that's the problem. Get rid of that. And when they got rid of that, the problem was gone. Is that a coincidence? No. People, we must know that Satan is not playing games. Satan wants to kill you and I. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy he wants to destroy your home. He wants to destroy your life. Now look at, let's look at African art. I've already told you what that pastor from Ghana said about African artifacts being an altar where demons can come and feed in your house. If you look at these pictures, you will see these masks. And you must realize now, people, if you did not have the knowledge, I pray that you will have the discernment and the knowledge after today that these masks are a symbol of certain deities in their culture. It's either a symbol of the god of war or the god of fertility or the god of uh, mining or the god of whatever. Now, we buy them and we bring them into our homes and they hang in, in, on our walls and suddenly we have problems. We don't know what is, where it's from. And if you look at the statues that they make with the faces, what's the problem there? The problem there is, people, that those statues, many times, the face depicts the face of the witch doctor of the specific village. And this is an aspect that we have discussed with black Christians and black non-Christians in South Africa, that when these artists finish making their handiwork, they call in the witch doctors. Not all of them. You must realize it's not all of them. But you don't know which of them did and which of them did not. But they call in the witch doctors and then they ask the witch doctors to pray over their handiwork so that they can get them sold. And the witch doctors come and they throw 
Muti, they call it Muti in South Africa, that is medicine. Uh, it's a powdery kind of stuff that they grind from different animal parts and all that. And they throw it over this and they call ancestral spirits over these things. Now you buy them and they hang in your home and there's a problem and you, you don't know where it's from. People, beware of African artifacts. Beware because Satan uses this. We have many, many, many testimonies about people getting rid of African artifacts, even the little animals that have been carved, the hippos and the rhinos and the giraffes and the what have you that people bought in Africa or bought in curio shops and they've got a problem, they don't know where it's from. Beware. Let the Holy Spirit of the Lord speak to you about that thing standing in your home. You must be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Now we look at the attack on our children from the packets of fries. First we had the Pokemons. Pokemon meant pocket monster. That's the meaning of the name Pokemon, pocket monster. The only monsters we have is the demon spirits sent by Satan. But they were cute. If you look at the pictures we have on the screen there, they were cute little things. But Satan soon realized that the Christians are breaking these plastic round tazos. People, and if you read your own papers in your own country or wherever, you would have read that schools banned Pokemons from schools because children were fighting with each other, stealing Pokemons from each other. Is that from God? No. So where does that come from? From the Pokemons. From the fact that there are certain demons attached to those little things that your children play with. But then Pokemon went out and in came Dragon Ball Z. And Dragon Ball Z, if you look at that picture that you have there, in the first instance, what's the problem? Let's start with the name Dragon Ball Z. Who's the dragon? Revelation 12 verse 9. Satan. Dragon Ball Z. And look at that little picture there. We have Babadi. Cute little thing, isn't he? No, it's not. That is a depiction of a demon. And what's interesting in this whole range of Dragon Ball Z Tazos, and look at it now, it's now made from metal because Satan realized that the Christians are breaking those plastic Tazos. So they made it from metal now. It does not break very easily. Same thing with the African art. In South Africa specifically, the African art, the, 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 the Satan found out soon that the Christians are burning those masks, burning that, the art. So nowadays they are being made from metal. Metal does not burn very easily. So, but let's look at Babidi here. And there are three in this range. The one's called Babidi, other one's called Babidi, and the third one's called Bo, or Boo, whatever you want to say. And a friend of mine who used to be in Satanism, she's a lady that's now doing missionary work across the borders of South Africa, she told me, Tian, Babidi, Babidi, and Bo, is a satanistic curse that was used to attack other people with. And a friend of mine phoned me yesterday and he said, Tian, I was very shocked. When I watched the, movie, uh, the, the animation movie Cinderella with my children a while ago, I heard the one fairy godmother singing while she was sewing, Bibbidi, Bubbidi, Bo, Bibbidi, Bubbidi, Bo. So what was she singing? Specifically this curse. And our children sing along. Our children play with these little things and they put it down and bibbidi bobbidi bow and they call things over themselves without realizing it. But you and I just allow them to play with it because we've got this argument that these things can do me nothing. And Satan laughs at us. Let's look at the following one. If you look at that face, do you see any love of Jesus shining out of that face? No, it's aggression. Then we have the following one, eternal Shenron dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Then look at this cute little one, Pan, P-A-N. It's a little pixie or a dwarf or an elf, call it what you wish. But doesn't it look cute? Yes, it does. But if you knew, Pan actually looked like the following picture. You see the goat of Mendes, part goat, part man. Pan is the god of the nature elementals. And do you remember, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. But if this is the way that Satan came into your house, if he came in as half goat, half man, would you have allowed him to your house, into your home? No, you wouldn't. Now, why do you allow him into your home when it comes in as a cute little elf? Because you are being deceived. And that's the way Satan works, with deception. He wants to close your eyes. And it's time that you ask the Holy Spirit of God to open your eyes. Don't let your children play with this. Look at the following one. Look at that face, that aggression on that face. And what happens? Your three-year-old daughter or son starts pulling his face like that. And you wonder, where does this come from? 
I did not teach him that. Neither did my wife. So where's it from? Well, he's playing with it. He sees it on his toys every day. And you allow him to play with that. After Dragon Ball Z in South, South Africa specifically came in Yu-Gi-Oh! And let's now look again what Revelation 12, 9 says. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And then Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone that uses divination, or a witch, or a charmer, or a wizard. Now let's look at the pictures of Yu-Gi-Oh! The one on the right-hand side of the screen. What is that red thing behind that little boy or girl? I still, to, to this day, don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. That's a dragon. Who's the dragon again? Satan. Now look at, let's look at some other pictures. The first one you see are all these uh, idols with a little eye on them. That eye refers to the one all-seeing eye of Lucifer. It's also called the eye of Horus. It's all from the occult people, and we let our children play with that. The following one is the blue eyes ultimate dragon. We know who the dragon is. The following one is a dark magician. A magician, magician practices witchcraft. He uses magic. And remember what Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 said? The following one is time wizard. Again, a wizard practices witchcraft. Silent child is the following one. Silent child is a child with a third eye open. It refers to being able to see demon spirits in the occultic realm, in the kingdom of darkness, to be able to communicate with them as a medium, as a spiritist. But we let our children play with this. The next one says willful goddess. Look at that, willful goddess. And remember, you may have no other gods before me, said the Lord. In the bottom corner, you will see it says fairy. We'll speak about the fairies a little later. Blackland fire dragon. Who's the dragon? Devil girl. People, what are we let, play, let our children, allowing our children to play with? We are allowing them to play with stuff from the kingdom of darkness. And we think God must just accept it. You see, we think God must conform to us instead of us conforming to him. Because he is not going to stand before our throne the day that we die. We are going to stand before his throne the day that we die. We are going to be accountable to him about what we allowed our children to play with. Because those children are children sent to earth by him. He wants us to teach our children about him. And so many people say to me, no, Tian, but we must teach our children about the fantasy worlds. Show me in the Bible where it, say, where it says that. Show me in the Bible where it says, teach your children about fantasies. I do see in the Bible that it says, stay away from fables. A fable, according to the dictionary, is a fabrication. A fabrication, according to the dictionary, is a lie. The Bible says, stay, stay away from lies. Don't teach your children fables. Don't teach your children lies. Teach them about the truth of Jesus Christ since the time when they are formed in the womb. Read the Bible to them. Play gospel songs to them. Sing to them hymns, psalms, and songs of praise towards the Lord, that they can grow up with that, that they can be born with that. But look at this devil girl. But while we're talking about devil girl, let's look at another girl. Bad girl. We see so many teenagers wearing these t-shirts saying, bad girl. Now Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, the power of life and death lie in the tongue. And whoever uses it shall reap the fruits thereof. So what is that girl saying? I am a bad girl. Or the boys, I am a bad boy. That's what you were saying. But that's not the truth because the Bible says your father is the king of heaven. He is the creator. So you are a princess, little girl. Or you are a prince, little boy. You are not a bad girl. You are not a bad boy. So don't speak that over yourself by the things that you wear. Get rid of the bad girl, bad boy image. Because we must be holy before God. We cannot stand before God with a bad boy image. We cannot stand before God with a bad girl image. Satan uses that against us to try and Pull us away from the Lord. Let's get back to holiness, sanctification before the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the following one, mask of brutality. And that thing comes and reveals himself to your little boy, 12 o'clock one night, and he screams and he says, Dad, 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 there's a round ball in my room with claws in his eyes. And you say to him, Ahman, that's your imagination. No, it's not his imagination. He's playing with this. And Satan comes and one of his demon spirits comes and disguises himself as this mask of brutality because he wants to put fear into your child's life. And the moment that you say it's your imagination, you must know it's not his imagination. He sees this because his spirit is still open. He can still see these things. And Satan wants to pull him away from God to his kingdom through that. And the moment that you say to him it's your imagination, he thinks daddy or mommy does not trust me. So how can I trust mommy or daddy? And immediately there is a rift 
in the relationship between father and son or mother and son or mother and daughter. The last one, human skull face, God insect. God insect people. Since when is an insect a god? Yes, this one being shown on the screen now is a scarab. The scarab was worshipped by the Egyptians. And we call it a god insect. God said man will rule over nature. We call an insect a god and we let our children play with that. What are we doing, people? Let the Holy Spirit of God speak in your heart about this. There's another range of cards on the marketplace today. It's called Magic the Gathering. And if you look at this first picture there, Magic the Gathering, Urza's Saga, you will again see a dragon there. This is the backside of the card, Magic the Gathering, Deck Master. And even adults play with this. And this is a game that can go on for months at a time. Now let's look at some of the cards and what it says. What's this all about? In magic, you play a powerful wizard. Remember Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 that says, there shall none be found among you that practices witchcraft. In magic, you become a wizard. You play a powerful wizard. And what happens? Drawing from your deck of cards, you control other wizards in summoning creatures and casting spells or whatever the case may be. And you also fight against other wizards. So you combat them. People, what is this about? This is not from the Lord. This is from the kingdom of darkness. Now lo let's look at some of the cards. This is another one. Look at that. Half human, half insect. This was not created by God. God did not create half human, half insect, or half human, half uh, fish, little mermaid. That's a problem. It's not from God. God did not create any one of us half fish, half human. That's from Satan. But it's being made cute so that we can bring it into our homes. Look at the following one. From the fires of Shiv to the darkness of Phyrexia, Urza seeks one thing, vengeance. And do you remember the Bible says, vengeance is mine, speaks the Lord, do not seek vengeance. These cards seek vengeance. Another card says, tombstone, in this black and blue deck, cycling cards give you options, while reanimation cards bring back the pain over and over. People, we're supposed to get rid of our pain. God says, I want to free you from your pain. Why play games that bring back pain? And I've heard people say, who play with these cards, that they actually feel pain when they have to kill some of their animals or some of the people in their deck, or deck of cards because they get so involved, even in the mind and in the spirit with this game, that they are being pulled away, that they really feel pain about this. Is this from God? Definitely not. Is one of the other pictures we have here. Vyashevan dragon. The dragon is Satan. Look at the other one. Thrall wizard. Do you think God created this? No, God did not. So who is it from? From Satan. Who is the wizard? We know you're not supposed to be do any wizardry or any magic. Foul imp. Look at that little thing. With his, with his horns and his evil face and his uh, pointed uh, uh, tail. Who is that? That's Satan. But our children can play with it. We even play with it ourselves. The other one, hell from beyond. Look at that face, people. Now your children play with those cards and they get nightmares and you don't know where it comes from because you are allowing your children to play with things that's from the kingdom of darkness. Then we have four different cards showing the angels in Magic the Gathering. And what's interesting, because I'm going to speak about angels a little later, look at all these angels. They're all, all women. They are all female. We'll speak about that a little later. Now, let's speak about Deuteronomy 18 verse 9 again and Jeremiah 10 verse 2. Remember the two verses that says, Do not learn the ways of the heathen. Do not do the abominations of the heathen nations. What are we talking about? Let's start with Hindu jewels. What jewels am I referring to? The ones that you read about on the screen now. Toe rings, ankle chains, tongue studs, lip rings, belly rings, eyebrow rings, nose rings. And we see that Dr. Peter Hammond has written uh, a part on the internet. He's a missionary and he writes, Amongst the Hindus, nose studs, belly rings, toe rings, tongue studs and eyebrow rings are common. So what is the problem? I've ministered in many churches about this. And in one specific church, I met a pastor who used to be a Hindu. His father is still a Hindu priest. So, and he confirmed all the things that, I said to you, uh, that I'm saying to you now. You see, in the Hinduism, the father of the house wears a toe ring. It symbolizes his authority. And people, the Hindus, they believe in about 330 million gods. It's on the internet. You can go and check it for yourself. 330 million gods. 
So it's 330 different demons, 330 million different demons that they are believing in. So when the father of the house dies, his toe ring is put on his eldest son's toe. That refers to his authority being transferred to his son, but not just his authority, also the demons that he believes in. And when the son marries, he puts a toe ring on his wife's toe. He transfers his authority in the home, in the house, over to his wife through that. And what happens? Not just his authority, all the demons spirits. Now you and I, we buy it for our wives or we buy it for ourselves or for our girlfriends. And we've got all the right arguments. It looks so sexy, it looks so nice, it looks so cute, whatever the case may be. And what happens? We are being bound. Our ladies are being bound by idols, things from the kingdom of darkness. A friend of mine used to wear one on each foot. And at one camp, she came on the Friday evening. What happened is they, she said they started to burn her on both feet. Blisters on each toe that she wore them on. And she took them off. On the Sunday, two lady friends came to her and said, but why did you take them off? And she said, well, they burned me blisters. And then they said, well, we must now just tell you, we prayed on Friday evening and said, Lord, if that is not from you, please let it burn her. And I just started laughing. I said, well, with friends like those, who needs enemies? But what does that confirm? It confirms that those things are not from God. So please, dear young lady, madam, whoever you are, get rid of that because it's an idol. Ankle chains. The problem with the ankle chain is the symbol of the ankle chain is a symbol of rebellion. It states in actual fact, I will not submit myself to the authority of any man. And I ministered to a lady in Pretoria in South Africa a few years ago. And when I told her this, her eyes became bigger saucers. And she said, Tian, my grandmother has been married for five times. And she says, I will not submit myself to any man. You see, the symbol of rebellion around her ankle became the way she spoke over year, years later. That's the way it works. You see, God's order is God, Christ, husband, wife. Not so that the husband can step on the wife. That's not what the submission is all about. But so that the husband can cover the wife. But Satan tries to pull that around, turn that around, so that the husband becomes the lesser one and the wife sits on his head or whatever the case may be. And that's against God's order. Tongue studs. What's the problem with the tongue stud? Except that I can't speak very nicely. I am now submitting my tongue to the kingdom of darkness. And Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, the power of life and death lie in the tongue. So I suddenly find that I'm speaking negatively, that I'm starting to swear, and I don't really want to. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Christian girl. I'm a Christian boy. I, I come from a Christian home, and, but suddenly something is wrong. What's wrong? Well, you see, I'm trying to please my friends. I'm not trying to please God. I'm playing with the kingdom of darkness through trying to please my friends. Galatians 1 verse 10 says, do I seek to please men or do I seek to please God? Because if I seek to please men, I cannot be a servant of Christ. Lip rings, the same problem. Belly rings, eyebrow rings, nose rings. Let's speak about belly rings quickly. The belly button. The belly rings that they wear there. I had a friend, or I still have a friend, a lady friend, uh, who wore one of these. And at one of the camps that we had, a friend of mine spoke about this. And she said, ah, this doesn't bother me. And I said, Do you, are you wearing one of those? She said, yes. She said, but Tian, it doesn't bother me. I said, listen, just watch out for the day that I might walk into your home and put my hand on your stomach and that thing tears out of your flesh. She said, it can't be that bad. I said, okay. And then she took the book that I wrote about this, about house cleaning, and she went home. And she found me two days later. She said, please come and clean my home because it's full of stuff that is not supposed to be here. Because there are people going to Zanzibar and Singapore and all those other places, then they buy some of those idols and they brought it back into their home. So we took that out, and then she said, you must pray for me. And I said, I will not. She said, why not? I said, are you still wearing your belly, belly ring? She said, yes. I said, okay, take it off, and I'll pray for you. And she said, okay, I'll take it off, but when I take it off, I'm going to give it to you, and you must take it away, because if you give it back to me, I am going to put it back in. I said to her, do you hear what you're saying to yourself? Can you hear that you are already so bound to that piece of metal that you can't say no to put it back into your own body? But she gave it to me. I put it in, into my pocket. And she sat from me about two or three paces away from me. People, when I prayed for her, when I started to pray for her, her head hit the floor between her knees where, where she was sitting. And she roared like a lion. It cost me prayer of approximately 15 to 20 minutes to free her in the name of Jesus Christ. 
You see, the enemy already had a hold on her body over the years that she wore that thing. And I'll tell you now why specifically there. But let's proceed and see what Dr. Peter Hammond also writes on the internet about it. You see, he's a missionary that goes through the whole world. He says the response of pagan people when they've embraced the gospel of Christ, from Papua New Guinea to the Amazon jungle, pagan tribes engage in body scarification, earrings, nose rings, tongue studs, multiple piercings, and tattoos. Once converted to Christ, however, these tribes abandon all these body modification practices. The interesting thing is that while so many Westerners rush into New Age religions, body piercing and occultism, many millions in the tribes mentioned in Africa, South America, Asia and the Pacific Islands are being converted to Christ and are abandoning the body piercing practices of their pagan past. It is very clear who are the Christians and who are the pagans in these mission fields. The pagans wear little or no clothing and they do engage in a variety of body scarification, body piercing and or tattoos. On the other hand, the Christians are easily identifiable. They wear clothes and they don't engage in any body modification. Of course, some older people will still have the scars and the holes, testimony of the pagan past before they were converted. But all earrings, eyebrow rings, nose rings and such like have been removed. And their children are free from these pagan disfigurements. It is unheard of in these areas for Christians to voluntarily pierce or tear tattoo their bodies. In fact, they are shocked when Western men visit them with ponytails and earrings. You see people, those people coming from that kind of background knows there is a problem with those things. That's why they take them off. The moment that they are converted, the moment that the Holy Spirit convicts them, they get rid of this. But we, who do not have this knowledge, argue with each other. Now let's proceed to tattoos. What's the problem with tattoos? Leviticus 19 verse 28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. What is a tattoo? Anything else than a print that has been put upon you. It is a print in your flesh. The Bible says you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, and you shall not print any marks upon you. Now where do the ladies get these prints? If you look at the pictures on the screen now, at the top left and the bottom left. The ladies usually get it either around the navel or just above the, bi the bikini with, that they wear or on the back, just above the bikini. Why there? You see, because, lady friend, that there and this over here and the belly button, it's all above your womb and your female parts and your ovaries. You see, Satan knows, the Bible states that you as a woman, is supposed to bear children for God's kingdom. You are supposed to bear children who will be champions for God on earth, leading people to Christ. Satan says, I want a hold on her ovaries. I want a hold on her womb. So what does he do? He makes it acceptable for us all to have tattoos there or here and for the ladies to wear these uh, belly buttons and the belly rings and there's a problem. And we don't know where it's from. And so we find that some young ladies start getting problems with their ovaries, start getting problems with their wombs, and they don't know where it's from. And then they say, oh, can it really be this cute little dragon that I have tattooed on my stomach? Yes, it can. Because we are disobedient to God's word. And what must we do now that you do have such a tattoo? Well, we have testimonies of people having prayed and the tattoos just disappearing like that. But that is very few and far between. But there are places that can remove them with laser or other ways. There are other ways to have them removed. Pray to the Lord Jesus to teach you where to go and what to do. Now let's speak about angels. Angels or cherubim. The Bible says in Hebrew 1 verse 7, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Just look at that. His angels are flames of fire. Psalm 103 verse 20 says, Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength that do his commandments. You see, angels excel in strength. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? You see, they are ministering spirits sent forth for us. So, they are, they excel in strength and they are ministering spirits and they are flames of fire. In Psalm 91 verse 10 to 12, it says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angel charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Who gives the angels charge? God does. We do not speak to the angels, people. 
we speak to God and we say, God, please send the angels around my home. God, God, please let the angels go with me when I'm on the road. That's what we do. But you see, what is the lie that Satan teaches us in the world outside? People speaking to angels. We have books and books and books about how to meet your guardian angel, how to speak to your angel and get your blessing. People, they are worshipping the creation and not the creator. You speak to the creator and he says to the angel, come and minister to this person. Come and minister to the other part of my creation. This is what you do. But you see, Satan ensures that we think angels look like the following pictures. We have this one that's very clear that we see in many places. And this one, this other one that I'm showing to you now. We must remember angels do not look like this. They are huge, excelling in spirit beings sent by God to minister to you and I. And we must speak to God about this. But we get so many Christians going to things that's called angel fairs and angel symposiums. And look at the cards that is found at those angel symposiums. And you'll see on this picture here that it says the angel power cards can send certain energies which can protect you. Really? I thought only God brings that. How can these cards do that? But Christians get these cards and they pull three cards in the morning and they say, this is my message from the angels every day. You're supposed to get the message from God from your Bible every day. You, can, you will also read there on the screen how, can you, how you, you can use these cards in various ways to tune into a new day or to invoke protection and support in time of need. How is that possible? How can angels bring you that if you don't speak to God about this? You cannot ask the angels to bring this. But let's look at some of the cards that we have. The first one we have there says, listen to the fine voice of your guardian angel and follow it on the left-hand side there of the screen. No, people, I would like to listen to the fine voice of the Holy Spirit and follow it. Then the next one says that trust the great force of life. Now, I would like to trust the Holy Spirit, please. That great force of life, you see, that's the new age God. That's the God within. That is what you see in the Star Wars movies and all these science fiction movies. And they are all not from God. Because in all those science fiction movies, you have half human, half animal, half human, half fish, half human, half insect. That's not from God. God creates perfectly. You see, so who is that from? Make up your mind and don't watch those things anymore because it corrupts your mind. It corrupts your children's minds and Satan uses it against us. Let's become pure before the Lord. Let's become sanctified. So I would like to trust the Holy Spirit. The next one says, destiny will fulfill your desires. No, Psalm 37 verse 4 says, God will fulfill your desires. But the following one says, feel the power of the angels and let it carry you through life. No, I would like to feel the power of the Holy Spirit and let it carry me through life. Top left, children are a promise of the angels. No, Proverbs says, children are a promise from God. You see, it's so close. It's so close because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Top right, which energy of the angels do you want to radiate today? None, thank you. I would like to radiate the energy of the Holy Spirit. Bottom left, the stars sparkle with a message from the angels. Now, if I look at the stars, I see a message about the Almighty God, how good He is, how great He is. And then the last one, bottom right, who does that look like? That's Buddha. But it's an angel. And people say, but that's an angel? No, that is a depiction of Buddha. And who is Buddha? He is an idol. So we play with this and we think God must be fine. But if we look at these pictures again of all these angels, you will realize they, again, are all female. Why is this? Remember I referred to Magic the Gathering, the female uh, uh, angels, and I show you six more pictures about those female angels from Magic the Gathering. See if you can see any male angel there. What is the problem? What is my problem that I have with this? People, you must come and show me the verse in the Bible that states God's angels as female. They are all shown as males. All through the Bible. Now it's very interesting to note that from the kingdom of darkness side, angels are always shown as female. Why? Because again, that is a forgery of the truth of God's word. So if anybody says, but I've got this lady angel that I've got in my room that I've uh, uh, painted or that somebody's given me, get rid of that. That's not from God. And even if people come to me and they say, but Tian, I had a revelation. An angel came and spoke to me. That angel was a lady. Then I asked those people, listen, please go back to the Lord and ask him whether it was one of his. Because remember, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
Because out of the kingdom of darkness, the depictions that we have of angels out of the kingdom of, of darkness, they are all female. The Bible says they are male. And if you look at Zechariah 5 verse 9, you will see it refers to two women with wings like a stalk. Those are not angels. That refers to judgment on specific people. So that's, those are not angels with the wings because a stork's wings has got black edges. An angel's wings does not have black edges. So those are not angels being referred to in Zechariah 5 verse 9. Fairies, dwarves, elves and trolls. People, we all grew up with fairies and dwarves and elves and trolls and we thought it were, they were so cute. What's the problem with the trolls if I start from the back? The trolls you will see on the right hand side of that picture. The top right and the bottom right. That's the way they are depicted. These little puppets that our children play with. You see, what we don't know is in the old Nor Norwegian, the, the, the language, the old Norwegian language, the word troll means demon. That is the meaning of the word. And we let our children play with that. Fairies, dwarves. The first time that the Lord started using me in this ministry, approximately four years ago, I was called by people and they said they've got a three-year, again, three-year-old little daughter who doesn't want to sleep in her room. I must come and help them. And I went in there and I saw fairies hanging from the roof and the fairies were painted on the walls and the fairies were standing on her bed and there was a duvet with fairies and all the little books about the fairy princesses and, and all the books that we've all read. And the Holy Spirit said to me, out, take it all out and the ones that are painted on the walls must not be painted over because then they're still there. It must be taken off, scraped off and then painted. And they did all that because they wanted to be obedient to the word of the Lord. And suddenly, that little girl slept in her room without any fear. And I said to the Lord, Lord, what's happening? And that's the first time that the Lord showed me Deuteronomy 7 verse 25. And he said, the graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. And I said, Lord, what's happening here? Show me more. And he, and he sent me to the internet and he said to me, type in fairies. And you can do it. You don't have to believe me. Go to your internet, type in fairies. And you will come into the certain regions of the northern hemisphere where people still believe in fairies like you and I believe in the Holy Spirit. So they are idols. But if you also read the folk tales of certain countries, you will realize that fairies are evil. They kill people. They make them ill. They make them sick. They bring diseases. They steal their children. They pull their children into darkness and then they exchange their children for, people, for human children. And so many people say, but those are all just stories. Really? Really? Where do stories originate? Somewhere where something happened in reality and it became a legend over time because somebody just added this and added that, but there was a root for that. And we know that they believe in these things because I went into the internet and I came onto this, the following picture that I'm showing you now. It's on the internet. It's called the Leprechaun Watch. You see people, the Leprechaun is the Irish fairy. Like we have different fairies in different countries and they call different things, dwarves or elves or leprechauns or sherries or pukas or pixies or gnomes. And if you read that part, you will see there is a certain place in Ireland that they are setting up a camera or that they did set up a camera in 2005 when I got this to, in, in a specific haunt that they want to photograph the sherries, the pukas and the leprechauns. You see people, they believe in these things so much that they actually put up technology, they actually use technology, they actually use cameras to try and photograph them. Now, if they did not believe in them, what is happening there? You see, now this proves that people believe in fairies, dwarves, elves, trolls, and these kind of things. So they are idols. But to you and me, they are being made cute through all the Walt Disney animation movies, Sleeping Beauty, and all those things that we all watch, Casper the Friendly Ghost. There's no such thing as a friendly ghost. Wendy the little, the little Witch. There is no such thing as a little friendly witch because they are all used from the kingdom of darkness. And they can come and argue with me about using white magic or black magic. Magic is magic. The Bible is very clear about that. We'll read about it a little, little later. But we must know, people, dwarves and elves are also a problem. I have a testimony of a lady in South Africa she got rid of the dwarves in her garden, the, the ones that we always buy that you've got in the gardens. And what happened, she, she tells me after they got rid of that, she forgot that she had the two lamps on her bed stands were also little dwarves. And after having broken the ones outside, suddenly one evening she woke up and something had been intimate with her. And her husband was sleeping, it wasn't him. And she became terrified. For two months this happened to her every night. 
And then a friend of her walked into the house, a friend who had this kind of knowledge. And the friend said, what are those dwarves doing on your bedstands? Break them. And she broke them. And that same evening, the problem was solved. She never had that problem ever again. Is that a coincidence? Let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you about that. Remember Exodus 20 verse 2 and 3 that says, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you about this. Clowns. What's the problem with a clown? 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed, or disguises himself, into an angel of light. A clown disguises himself into something he is not. And we have many testimonies about clowns being problems for children, children being afraid of clowns, they being, being terrified of clown, clowns. Why? Because there is a spirit behind those clowns. And, they, and the people playing clowns don't even know that themselves because they are bound by that. And the Lord says, we do not wear masks. We are supposed to be transparent towards each other. So let's get out from behind our masks. Eastern statues, clothes, and items. People, when I refer to Eastern statues, clothes, and items, I am not referring to the fact that it says made in China or made in Japan. That is not the problem. The problem is the Eastern symbols that you and I don't know what they mean. Because if you look at the picture on the screen now, bottom right-hand side of that picture is the symbol for Chinese, the, the Chinese symbol for dragon. Now you have in your home or your children has in his room or a child has in his room either curtains or a duvet set full of Eastern symbols with that symbol on it as well. And you don't know what's going on in his room because he's got a symbol of a dragon in his room. And I get to so many people and they say to me, but that means love. And I say, how do you, mean, how do you, know, do you know that? Do you read Chinese? No. They told me that. Well, if I tell you that means hate, who's it right now? Oh, we don't know. You see, if you're not sure, when in doubt, it's out. It's a saying that we use, when in doubt, it's out. Let the Holy Spirit of the Lord lead you about this. Because in Isaiah 2, verse 5 and 6, we read, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. You see, we are so busy with things from the East, while the things from the East, in so many instances, come, come from certain Eastern religions. And the Eastern religions, the symbol that they have many times is who? The dragon. And who is that? Satan. But now we learn the heathen ways. And remember the two verses that said, you shall not learn the ways of the heathen? Because... God has not changed it. He still has a problem about idols. doesn't matter where that idol comes from. If that idol comes out of your own mind or if that idol comes from the east or the west or the north or the south, God has got a problem with idols that are symbols of Satan or whatever the case may be. We've seen some of these statues in many homes and it looks very nice. But if you see there on the second picture in the middle, what is on that girl's uh, 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 robe that she's wearing? It's a dragon. Now, this stands in your home, and it looks so nice, and it looks so cute, and it is beautiful art. You see, in the name of art, and in the name of drama, Satan has done many, many things in our homes without us even realizing it, because we're being caught by that. Now, let's look at the following little idol, Cupid. Cupid is not some adorable little mischievous god who makes couples fall in love. This is now according to Dr. Kathy Burns, who wrote the book Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated. He is a god, really a demon, of vulgarity and indecency. Our society is so inundated and saturated with paganism. We just accept it as part of life. You see, and there is the problem that we Christians have. We just accept it as part of life. You see, we Christians do not have the guts anymore to say no to the world. We just conform to the world. We just go with the world because we are so afraid that we will be persecuted. People, the Bible says, if you walk the road with the Lord, really walk the road, the road with the Lord, you will be persecuted. There's no maybe about it. You will be persecuted. We just accept it as part of life, not realizing how we must be offending God. And there's the problem. We do not realize how we offend God by playing along with these things in the world. By using and propagating pagan symbolism. You see, we propagate pagan symbolism because on Valentine's Day, every one of us buys each other Valentine's cards with Cupid on it or coffee mugs with Cupid on it and we play the game. And idolizing perverted and evil pagan gods and goddesses. We must stop this, people. We must not learn the ways of the heathen. The other idol is this one. This charm, this is now called the dream catcher. This charm is from the Ojibwe tribe in Minnesota. You see, these are idols from the Red Indians. The good in their dreams, they put this dream catcher above a baby's bed. 
And they believe that the good in their dreams are captured in that web. But the evil in their dreams escapes through the hole in the center. They believe, so that means this is an idol because they believe in it. They believe that the dream catcher holds the destiny of their future. No, people, the destiny of your future and your children's future is only in the hands of God, the creator of heaven and earth and of Jesus Christ, through, which, uh, through whom and by whom everything was created. You must remember that. Now let's look at the question about divination and communicating with the dead. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 12 says, There shall not, listen, there shall not be found among you anyone that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, that's talking to the dead. For all that do these things, listen, all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. There's no exception. Any wizard, any witch, any enchanter, any consulter with familiar spirits is an abomination unto the Lord. And remember, the Lord has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and in all eternity. Isaiah 8 verse 19 says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God? Instead of running to these wizards and running to these spirits and to these mediums to call up the dead, to raise the dead. We are supposed to go to God and speak to Him. Leviticus 19 verse 31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. You see, you will be defiled by going to people saying that I've got the power to speak to the dead. I've got the power to raise the dead. I received a gift from God to speak to the dead. Where does that come from? Because the Bible says it is an abomination to the Lord your God to speak to the dead. You see, we believe what the people say instead of what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. It's time that we get back to believing what the Word of God says. Leviticus 20 verse 6 says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I, God, will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. This is how serious this thing is in God's eyes, people. And God has not changed about this. You and I have changed, and we must change back. We must change back to the way we're supposed to be before God, holy, sanctified, his children, like God. <clears throat> to be like God, the same way that he is. Isaiah 26, verse 14. So many people say to me, Tian, but uh, um, I saw my grandmother walking up and down in our home. No, it's not your grandmother. That is a demon spirit disguising himself as your grandmother. Your grandmother who died 20 years ago is in heaven or in hell, depending on what she decided on this side. Isaiah 26 verse 14 says, They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. So many people say to me, Betian, we've had these television programs about speaking to people on the other side and all that. What happens there then? We must all realize that each one of us have certain familial and familiar spirits coming with our families for generations. They do not die. So the moment that your grandfather dies, your father in inherits those spirits and those spirits come with the family. And when your father dies, you got them and they walk with you. Now you come to this person and you tell this person, please call up grandfather Mickey for me, please. Because I did not greet him before he died. What happens? This spirit that used to be with grandfather Mickey for many ages, who walked into that place with you, now disguises himself. And this lady or this person who is a medium or who is a spiritist starts communicating with the spirit behind you. And he says, or she says, Grandfather Mickey, come and speak to your grandson, please. And this spirit now starts to speak in the voice of Grandfather Mickey because he knows the way Grandfather Mickey spoke. And he snorts like Grandfather Mickey and he says, oh, I'm fine, don't worry about me. And what, what happens? You say, oh, this works. I'm very interested in this. I want to know more. And now you are being pulled into the occult instead of being free and getting away from the occult. You see, spiritual knowledge, knowledge from the Bible, keeps you away from evil. That kind of knowledge pulls you into evil. And so many people say, but the things he said, they became true. Yes, why? Because Satan, has got, Satan also has certain human agents on earth. If that person tells you, that fortune teller or that medium or that spiritist or whoever you went to, tells you tomorrow you will see a tall dark man walking past you in a blue suit, what happens? Satan ensures that one of his agents will wear a blue suit the next day to walk past you. 
and you think, oh, it works. No, this is divination. It's an abomination to the Lord your God. 2 Samuel 12, verse 23 says, But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? This is David speaking after his little baby died. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. People, when your people have died, they are not hanging around here in some semi-conscious state. They either go to heaven or to hell where they will spend eternity. They do not return to us here. And that's why you must also know the thing about reincarnation. I'll speak about that a little later. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 from another side. Let's just look at it again. There shall not be found among you, not be found among you, anyone that uses divination or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a wizard for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Now let's see in which movies or which places are people using divination or enchanting or being a witch. Let's start with the Chronicles of Narnia. The Chronicles of Narnia, which is on the market now, in the movie theaters all over the world. And people say, but this symbol symbolically refers to Christ. This is a biblical story. No, it's not. The fact that it was written by C.S. Lewis, who called himself a Christian, does not raise that book above the truth of the Bible. The Bible says anyone who uses magic is an abomination unto the Lord. Anyone who is a witch is an abomination unto the Lord. Now people say, but Tian, the, the, the line in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is a symbol of Christ who died and was resurrected. People, the Bible says the lamb was slain, not the lion. That is a lie. The Chronicles of Narnia at this stage, and I know churches all over the world are teaching Narnia sermons. And, and, and then remember, Matthew 24, 24 says, in the end times, even the elect may be deceived. Please don't let yourself be deceived. The fact that the, it was written by a so-called Christian does not mean that that book is now more important than the Word of God. If uh, Benny Hinn should write a book about a lot of thieves stealing from each other and then one of the thieves dying on behalf of his friends, does that mean stealing is now acceptable because the book was written by, by Benny Hinn, who is a great man of God? No, that's not what it means. Because the Bible is still our first and only source for the truth. Let yourselves be led by the Bible, not by what people say about books that people wrote. Let yourselves be led by the Word of God. Harry Potter, Rafiki in Lion King, Brother Bear, Aladdin, Care Bears, Gummy Bears, Powerpuff Girls, Peter Pan, Tinkerbell, Lord of the Rings, Charmed, Sabrina, Mary Poppins, Snow White, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, King Arthur in Merlin, Oh, King Arthur, Merlin in the King Arthur story, sorry. Sleeping Beauty, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, in all these things, and I can go on until tomorrow morning. They are using magic or witchcraft or enchantment. And remember Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 says, that all who do these things, all, remember, all who do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. So people, many people say to me, Tiana, have you read the Harry Potter books? I say, no, I haven't. Then they say, how can you say some things like the things you're saying? I say, because I've read my father's book. And I know my father's book says, all who do these things is an abomination to the Lord. Harry Potter uses magic. He's an abomination to the Lord. Then they say to me, nobody uses white magic. I don't care if he uses pink magic. He uses magic. You see, and that is an abomination unto my father. And I am accountable to him. I will stand before his throne one day. I will not stand before your throne, sir. I will not stand before any professor's throne. I will not stand before any pastor's throne or any preacher's throne. I will stand before my Lord's throne. And he will judge me on the things that I said about the abominations that we Christians are allowing in our homes at this stage. You see, if we go back to the Acts, in Acts we read, that the new believers did the following, Acts 19, verse 18 and 19. Many of the believers came publicly admitting and revealing what they had done. Many of those who had practiced, practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in public. You see, in that time, they burned the books about magic. These days, Christians buy books about magic. These days, Christians write books about magic. And they think it's acceptable to the Lord. In those days, they burned books. What happened in the past 2005 years, 2006 now? What happened is we've been deceived, people. We Christians have been deceived and we've learned the way of the heathen. And we are being attacked. If I look at the following symbol in the book Satanism in South Africa, it is written that this sign represents Lucifer falling from heaven like lightning. It is also a sign of ownership or of authority and of satanic strength and power. And guess who wears that symbol on his forehead? Harry Potter. He wears a symbol 
of ownership, authority, and satanic strength and power on his forehead, but people say to me, there's nothing wrong with Harry Potter. In whose eyes? Your eyes or God's eyes? So Leek, who was a witch many years ago in the, in the 80s, 1980s, wrote, the charms have been worn throughout the ages as a focal point that can be charged with the appropriate vibrations. I'm now speaking about the good luck charms that so many women and even men wear. There is an increasing business in the sale of charms today, though now they be only part of a dangling bracelet. It seems like the amulet and talisman are gaining a new lease of life, whether or not the buyers and wearers are aware of their significance. People, you see, the witches know that if they want to attack your body, they just need a point of contact on your body. And if you wear charms, that's it. Now, this caption comes from the book Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated. You see, if we look at the following picture, the charms are the things that I've encircled in red. It's not the chain. The chain is not the charm. The charm are the things that we attach to that chain. And even though there may be an angel on that picture, Dr. Kathy Burns writes, we cannot Christianize, Christianize pagan practices even if we include a Jesus or an angel charm. Remember, a charmer is also called an enchanter or a magician. What are we playing with, people? Can we take something out of the kingdom of darkness, write Jesus across it now, say, okay, this is now a Christian symbol? No, it's not. The following one is the pentagram. The pentagram is considered by occultists to be the most potent means of conjuring up evil spirits. The star symbolizes the power of witchcraft. It is an aid in the casting of spells. <clears throat> so, people... You see there the pentagram from Masonic, the Freemasons, the symbol that they have of the pentagram, and then also the pentagram that the witches use in Wicca. And the one on the right is the Star of Muhammad out of Islam, which says what? That they are also using the same background. The following one is the Triskeli, the Celtic version of the yin and yang symbol. It represents the wholeness of life. It is a circle enclosing three spiral figures that appear to move in the same direction from a single central point. Triplicity symbolizes the stages of life. Birth, death, and rebirth, or reincarnation. It also symbolizes triple six, and it further symbolizes peace within oneself. Where do we find this in the world? Let's look at the following pictures. You can see all the pictures there. And you'll see on some of them it is written reincarnation, or success through hypnosis. But that symbolizes the triple six. That symbolizes darkness. And we people think, oh, it's acceptable. It's such a beautiful thing. I can put it on my home. I can put it in my, in my car or whatever, wherever the places we put it. We even find the one in the middle on the right-hand side on the New King James Bible. We must ask the people who wrote the, translated the New King James Bible why that is on that Bible. You see, if we come back to reincarnation, people, Hebrews 9 verse 20 says, there is no such thing as reincarnation because the Bible states very clearly, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You see, you only die once. You don't die a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time in a second life and a third life and a fourth life. There is no such thing as that. That's a lie from Satan. Isaiah 26 verse 14 we had before. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. That's what the Bible says. And again, 2 Samuel 12, 23 I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David speaking about his, day, his baby who has died. Now we proceed to the Egyptian things we bring into our homes. We have these beautiful framed papyrus uh, uh, pictures of all these Egyptian idols and deities and demons. What's the problem with that? Romans 1 verse 22 and 23 says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I read that to mean half man, half beast, half man, half uh, bird, half man, half insect. On the top right-hand corner of the picture there, you see the unk. The unk is a symbol of fertility and of reincarnation. Then next to that, we see the eye of Horus. Then we have Anubis, who is the god that took the souls of the dead into uh, um, Hades or wherever they called it in, in, in Egypt. And top left we have Ra, the sun god, half man, half uh, eagle or half falcon with the sun disk above his head. Bottom right, half man, half lion, the sphinx. Bottom left, bottom right is Isis, half woman, half eagle. You see, we're playing. Jeremiah 46 verse 25 says, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings. It took the Lord 40 years to get his people out of Egypt and to get Egypt out of his people. 
Now, his people, you and I, are all falling back into Egypt. We all want all these Egyptian things. And remember, Egypt is still a symbol of the world out of the Bible. Pharaoh is a symbol of Satan in the Bible. Masks, people, mask is a symbol of something it represents. God says we do not live behind masks. So beware of the masks that you hang in, in your house all over. Now look, let's look at a few horses. Pegasus, the winged horse. It's a symbol of astral projection. It's a new pagan symbol from Greek mythology. The unicorn. It represents the moon in astrology. It's a symbol of rebirth or reincarnation. Here we are. Reincarnation again. From Roman mythology. And you can look in all the pictures or most pictures of unicorns. You will always see either an elf or a dwarf or a fairy with the unicorn. Gargoyles, symbols of the forces of the cosmos, images of the demon-infested underworld. And we find these on the top of cathedrals in Europe and all other places. And there was a, an animation video a few years ago, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And guess who played the heroes along with the hunchback? Two of these gargoyles, and they were so cute. Like in Mulan, you remember the, the, the video about Mulan? Who played the role with her? A little red dragon, and so cute. The griffin. What is the griffin? Griffin is, you'll see there on the pictures, it is half eagle, half lion, and you also get it on, on, on these uh, family crests. And they, according to, to, to the knowledge that we have about them, they protected kings and drew chariots of goddesses. You see, there is the link between the griffin and goddesses being idols. Dante came and he said, no man, the griffin is a symbol of the earthly and divine natures of Christ. Please. How can you bring that together, that our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is symbolized by something that is half bird, half animal? That's not our Lord. And then it also states that it was also associated with the god Apollo and the goddesses Athena and Nemesis. You see, again, we are busy with idols and we bring it into our homes. But, and if it's on your family crest, what do you do? You get rid of your family crest because your family crest is the family crest of God, the Creator. There is no such things as griffins and these kind of idols on family crests belonging to God. Then we proceed and we look at a few of the Masonic symbols, the Freemasons. The problem with the Freemasons is Albert Pike, who is a 33rd degree Freemason, stated this very clearly, that the Masonic religion, now that's against the Bible, because the Bible says there's only one religion, the belief in Jesus Christ. But he said the Masonic religion should be maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. He also proceeded to say, to say, yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai, the God of Christians, is also God. But Lucifer, the God of light and the God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and of evil. Is that from God? No, that is from Satan. Now let's quickly look about uh, the horoscopes that we all read. We read the horoscopes. What's the problem with the horoscopes? Isaiah 47 verse 13 says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. You see, even in that time, in Isaiah's time, they had people proclaiming things on a monthly basis, like the horoscopes today on a daily basis or a weekly basis. We must get rid of that, people. 2 Kings 23 verse 5 says, King Josiah put down the idolatrous priests that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. But by reading horoscopes today, we are doing exactly the same things. We must get rid of that. It's not from God. Then we look at the sun and the moon with a face. The sun and the moon with a face personifies the sun or the moon. It refers to sun god and moon god worship people. This is not from God. If you want to draw the sun, draw the sun like it is, just the sun or just the moon. The moment that you give it a face, it refers to, refers to sun god or moon god worship. And so many people make these things and they say to me, but Tian, I drew that myself. I did not know it was an idol. Let's look at what Isaiah 45 verse 16 says. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols, even if you know it or not. Let's quickly look at burning of frankincense. The Coven of Celestial Tides on the internet writes the following. Egyptians used frankincense in their religious rites, as did the Babylonians and the Assyrians. It was Herodotus who reported that the thousand talents weight was offered every year during the Feast of Baal, that is Baal, the sun god, on the great altar of his temple. So frankincense was burned in religious rites to offer offerings to gods, idols. Isaiah 66, 66 verse 3 says, he that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol, yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abomination. 
He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. You see, if you burn incense, it is as if you bless an idol, as if you glorify an idol. Then so many people say to me, no, Matian, I burn incense in my home for, for what I smell. It's not for blessing an idol. And I say, okay, but if you look at the packet in which you bought it, and you look at all the symbols on that packet, the Eastern symbols and all that, do you think the people who made those may not be blessing an idol through that, but now you bought it and brought it into your house? Let the Spirit of the Lord speak into your heart about this and open this for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Now I want to speak to you about gambling, the lotto, and lucky draws, the so-called lucky draws. What is the problem there? If we look at Isaiah 65, verse 11 and 12, we read, But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop. If we look at the Hebrew, we'll see it refers to the God Gad, G-A-D, or also the God of fortune. And that furnish the drink offering unto that number. And the Hebrew word there refers to many, M-E-N-I, or the goddess of fate. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. You see, people, gambling, lotto, and lucky draws, you are playing with fortune and with fate. And this is not from God. And so many people are losing millions in gambling casinos and all over the world because they are bound by the spirit of bondage pulling them into bondage to do the lotto and the lucky draws and the gambling. And we even do lucky draws in our churches and we think it must be acceptable to the Lord. It's not acceptable to the Lord if you look at that verse in the Bible. Go and read it verse for verse, line upon line. And if you look at the Hebrew there, you will see that troop refers to the God of fortune and that number refers to the goddess of fate. So let's get out of this. Let's become holy before the Lord. Then we look at the labyrinth. And Albert Pike wrote about the labyrinth. It, a labyrinth is built in honor of the sun. In other words, it is sun god worship. What is the problem with the la labyrinth? Well, some were designed with the purpose of luring devils into them so that they might never escape. It is from the Latin labor plus intus. It is into, meaning into, entering the place of, the place of entering into labor, birth or rebirth. So we are busy with reincarnation again. And this also comes from the book Masonic and Occult Symbols of Dr. Kathy Burns. And she also refers to a thing called the Labyrinth Walk. And it was very interesting when I read this that she says that the Labyrinth Walk is something that is done because I picked it up in South Africa as well. That the Labyrinth Walk is coming into South Africa as well and people are doing it here as well. And what is this all about? It is a medieval occult practice which becomes a walking meditation. People walk and contemplate walking to the center of their spirituality. Meantime, they are walking straight into darkness and they don't know what they are playing with. Let's look at wind chimes. Wind chimes, it sounds so cute. People, they are used in Feng Shui in the east to channel energy fields around the house. It is also used to call up certain spirits. It is believed, again believed, it's an idol. It is believed to attract good luck or suppress bad luck. You see, these people believe that whether it's made from bamboo or wood or metal or, and whether it consists of three or five or six chimes, that it can be used to attract good luck, suppress bad luck, attract health, attract wealth, attract success or whatever the case may be. Those are idols. And remember, you may have no other gods before me, even though it sounds so beautiful when the wind blows through them. It's all about being obedient to God's word. Let's quickly look at some general occultic symbols. The first one is the witch's foot, or we know it as the so-called peace symbol in the world. There was no, never such a thing as this peace symbol. This witch's foot symbolizes the breaking away from the Christian church. But so many Christians wear it around their necks, and they think it's so beautiful. That is a symbol of breaking away from the Christian church. The next one is the moon sign, used by witches as a sign that they worship the moon. This is the sign that they use. The other one, sign of the horns, at satanistic rituals, it is used to show the sign and say, Hail Satan. This is all according to the book Satanism in South Africa. By a well-known man in the police, who was in the police for many years, uh, Kubis Jonker. And all people know that he's uh, an expert in, about Satanism and the things of the occult. So people, if your children show this sign, and they play with this sign, and you wonder what's going on. Let the Lord speak to you about this. The swastika. 
It's also called the sun wheel, and it's used by many religions when worshipping the sun god, the yin and yang sign. It symbolizes the unification of opposites, good and bad, male and female, Satan and God, according to Satanism in South Africa. In other words, I now ask the question, that means there is good in every evil, including in Satan, and evil in every good, including in God? Is that what it says? No, that's a symbol of darkness. We must not either practice under it or be a part of that or have it in our homes. The witch gram or the hexagram is used at witch festivals where evil spirits are called up. The th order of the Thelemic Golden Dawn writes on their page on the internet, each line of the hexagram indicates the number triple one. There are six lines in all, so the triple one times six is triple six, the most holy number of the sun. Now, who's the sun god? Lucifer. Who's the sun god? Satan himself, according to them. And what does the Bible say? The number of the beast will be triple six. It still refers to the same background, the king of darkness, Satan himself. People... That is the problem. The witch gram or the hexagram, also the so-called star of David. David never had such a star. This is the crest of Solomon, the star of Remphan that we see in Acts, where uh, Stephen is being stoned to death. He refers to the star of Remphan. That is not the star of David. ACDC, this rock group, this was a slogan, ACDC. It means after Christ, devil comes. Antichrist, devil's child. It shows loyalty to Satan. And it's used regularly to this day by various other heavy metal groups to indicate their loyalty to Satan. Now, our children wear T-shirts with ACDC written on it, and we think it's fine. It must be acceptable to God. Because we want to be so much part of the world, we don't want to be a part of God. Because we forget that we're going to stand before His throne one day. Let's look at the Christmas tree now. What's the problem with the Christmas tree? Jeremiah 10, verse 1 to 5. People of Israel, listen to the message that the Lord has for you. He says... Do not follow the ways of other nations. The religion of these people is worthless. The what? The religion of these people is worthless. A tree is cut down in the forest. It is carved by the tools of the woodworker and decorated with silver and gold. It is fastened down with nails to keep it from falling over. It's given little foots, feet, little feet to stand on. Such idols are like scarecrows in a field of melons. What is the Christmas tree? Because it's being decorated with silver and gold. You see people, in Jeremiah's time already, the heathen nations had a practice of cutting down a tree in the forest, a green tree symbolizing new life, giving it little feet to stand on so that it does not fall over, decorating it with silver and gold, and going from home to home, giving each other gifts. And remember, do not follow the ways of the other nations. Do not learn the heathen nations' abominations. We learn that with the Christmas tree. Exodus 20, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you remember that? Have no other gods before me. We have testimonies of homes that we went into, problems in the home. The only thing that was in there was the Christmas tree. We took out the Christmas tree and the problem was solved. We must come pure and clean before our Lord. What's the problem with Santa Claus? In Latin and in Spanish, the word Santa means holy. The Bible says only God is holy. Now let us proceed. What's the further problem? If we look at, uh, in the occult, we find a thing which is called an anagram. An anagram is a rearranging of letters. Now Santa Claus is a rearranging of Satan, Lucas. And Lucas, or Lucis, as you see it on the screen now, is a new age anagram for Lucifer. So Santa Claus is an anagram for Satan, Lucifer. Do you think that's acceptable to the Lord? And then so many people say to him, but Tian, you must remember Santa Claus as we know him now only came into existence uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s when it was used in an ad uh, for a specific well-known cold drink. Let's look what Satan said many thousands of years ago in Isaiah 14 verse 12 to 14. It is stated, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will be like the Most High. This was Satan's plan from the beginning. This was the reason why Satan was thrown out of heaven in the first place. He said, I will be like the Most High. Now let's see if eventually he did succeed in this by using the cute Santa Claus. Matthew 23 verse 9 says, Call no man on earth father, and we call him Father Christmas. Revelation 1.14 says, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. This refers to Jesus Christ. And guess 
whose hairs are white like wool, as white as snow too, Santa Claus. Isaiah 63 verse 2 says, Who is this that cometh red in apparel? Who comes along with red clothes on? Jesus Christ. And guess what? So does Santa. White hair, white beard, red clothes. Because I will be like the most high. Is this a coincidence? Mark 6 verse 3 says, Is not this the carpenter? Who was the carpenter? Jesus Christ. And guess what? Santa Claus is also a carpenter. In the beginning, when he came into existence, everybody knew that Santa Claus is a carpenter. He makes wooden toys for the children. Ezekiel 8 verse 14 says, The Lord's house, Zion, was towards the north. And guess where Santa Claus's house is? The North Pole. Deuteronomy 33 verse 26 says, Who rideth upon the heaven in thy help? Who goes through heaven in the blink of an eye? God. And guess who else on his sleigh? In the blinking of an eye, he goes across the heavens and he gives all the children across the world their gifts in, on the same night. Just like God. Going through the heavens just like God. Then in Zechariah 2 verse 6 in the Old King James, you will not find this in any other translation. Only in the Old King James, in Zechariah 2 verse 6, it is stated, Ho, ho, saith the Lord. And guess what? Santa Claus says, Ho, ho, ho. What a coincidence. Why doesn't he say ha, 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 or he, he, he? Why specifically does he say ho, ho, ho? Because I will be like the Most High. Do you remember? Revelation 12 verse 9 refers to, And his angels were cast out with him. This refers to Santa's elves. We've already spoken about the problem with elves and dwarves and all that. Psalm 102 verse 24 says, Thy years are throughout all generations. This refers to, to God who does not have an age, who keeps on living forever and ever. And guess what? So does Santa. Santa does not die. He keeps on going and going and going forever and ever. Just like God. Proverbs 1.23 says, I will pour out my spirit. This refers to the Holy Spirit. But Santa also has a spirit. If you look at all the movies at Christmas time, you see the spirit of Christmas present and the spirit of Christmas past and the spirit of Christmas to come. Those are demon spirits. Psalm 34 verse 11 says, Come ye children, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And Santa, what do we teach our children? There's a little song that we sing, you better be good, you better be nice, because Santa knows who's naughty or nice. So what do we do? Little child, if you are naughty, you will not receive a gift. So we teach our children the fear of Santa Claus instead of the fear of the Lord. Matthew 25 verse 31 says, Then shall he sit, sit, then shall he sit excuse me for that one, upon the throne of his glory. Who does this refer to? Jesus Christ. And guess what? Santa also sits on a throne. And what happens on that throne? Mark 10, verse 13 and 14. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me. But guess what? Santa also says, Bring the little children to me. He sits on his throne and he says, Bring the little children to me. A few days prior to Christmas or whatever the case may be, you see in our malls all over the world, all these Santa Clauses sitting on their thrones saying, bring the little children to me. And if you look closely, you will see many of those little children cry. They scream. They want to pull away. But the parents push them towards Santa Claus. What's happening there? That little child's spirit has already picked up that spirit on that chair. And he does not want to go there. He's afraid of that spirit. But the mother and father who do not have this kind of knowledge, they push him towards Santa Claus. So if you do have pictures of your children on Santa Claus's lap. Get rid of that as well, please. John 10 verse 42 says, And many believed on him. This refers to people believing on Jesus. But guess what? Our children believe in Santa Claus because we taught them to believe in Santa Claus. And we have testimonies of young children, teens, teenagers, testifying to this, that when they grew up and eventually found out that Santa Claus was just their father lying to them, playing Santa Claus, it was just all a farce, all just a fabrication, all just a lie. They came to the point where that same father came to them and said, my son, I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. And immediately that son said, but father, I could not believe you about Santa Claus. How can I believe you about Jesus Christ? You see, you lie to me about Santa, dad. How do I not know you're lying to me about Jesus Christ? And wham, the lie takes our children and it pulls them away from God and from eternal life, from Jesus. 
through a cute little person called Santa Claus. And we think it's acceptable to God. Titus 2 verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. But on the evening prior to Christmas, on Christmas Eve, what happens? All the children sit outside or sit in the homes looking for that glorious appearing of Santa Claus, listening for the jingle bells, listening for Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And we all fall for these fabrications, these fables, these lies. And we are being pulled away from the truth of the word of God. And we must become obedient to the word of God again. And I ask the question, are all these things that I've now shown you mere coincidences? No, we have a specific uh, part from a magazine that uh, comes from America, uh, The Onion. It was written in the period 29 November to 5 December 94. And it says the following, I love visiting each and every one of your homes, stuffing your stockings with toys and enjoying the milk and cookies you leave for me. But mostly I love Christmas because it's the celebration of the birth of my son, Jesus the Christ. You see, I'm God. Don't I look familiar? I'm old. I have a white beard. I love everyone. I'm the same God as the one you and your mommy and daddy worship on Sundays. Okay, I admit it. I'm not God, but I'm better than God. I'm jollier and I give you real toys, not boring old psalms you can, and empty promises you can only collect on when you die. Worship me, not him. Worship Santa. I am God. People, what are we playing with? Now they tell me, no, but this, this magazine is a satirical magazine. It's jokingly referring to this. This is not really saying something. Do you re remember there's a specific English saying that says, many a true word is spoken in jest. So I know that Satan is trying to pull us away from the truth of God's word. Now let's look at something that I call King Josiah's CV, his curriculum. If you should apply for a job at some place, this would be used and say, but look, this is what I did in my lifetime. We read about him in 2 Kings 23 verse 1 to 25. And we read that this little king, he was eight years old when he became king. When he was 18, the high priest brought the book of the Lord from the temple to him and he read it to him. And then when the king heard the things that was written in the book of the Lord, and the book of the Lord in our day is the Bible. What did the king do? Let's read. And the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets and all the people of the nation. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. He read the whole book of the covenant to them. At that stage, it was the first five books of the Bible, including Deuteronomy, which remember states the graven images of their gods you must burn with fire. Remember that verse. What did the king do then? He, he told this to the nation. Listen to what the word of, the, of, of God says. Like I'm telling you today, listen to what the word of God says about bringing idols into your homes. And then the people said, now we've got a similar situation as between Joshua and the nation when Joshua died that I referred to at the beginning of the, this DVD. We have a repetition of a similar situation. Now it's just King Josiah and the nation. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. So those people again said, we will follow the Lord with everything we have. And the moment that they did that, what did the king do? And the king commanded to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, the sun god, and for the grove. The grove refers to Ashtoreth, one of the uh, uh, goddesses of some of the nations, and for all the host of heaven. That's the zodiac signs. And he burned them. Why did he burn them? Because Deuteronomy 7 verse 25 in the book of the covenant said, you must burn their graven images with fire. You may not anoint them. Remember what I said about that. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. That again is the zodiac and the horoscopes. And he brought out the grove, Ashtoreth. Now, Ashtoreth has different names. It is the goddess of fertility and of lust. 
She has different names in different cultures. In one culture, she's called Ashtoreth. In another culture, she's called Venus. In another culture, she's called Diana. It's still the same goddess. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron, and he burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it to small, small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the, grave, upon the graves. People, and I'm speaking very fast, but you have to just, if necessary, just push the pause button and just listen to what I'm saying again. Even when you burn these things that the Lord is now showing you in your home, don't leave the ashes on your property. You must take it to the general dump where you dump all your stuff. Don't leave it on your property because even on the ashes there may be a problem. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. Again, burning, burning, burning. You see, he is obedient to the word of the Lord line upon line. And he break in pieces the images, the idols, and he cut down the groves. Again, that was the Ashtoreth idols, the, the priestesses of lust. And the high places builded for Ashtoreth of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh of the Moabites, and for Milcom of the children of Ammon, that the king defile. And the word defile there means took away, broke to pieces, uh, destroyed. But why, why did I leave this in this part of my presentation? Because today we just give it other names. We've got idols of Buddha, idols of the Hindus, and idols of the African arts in our homes, or fairies, or uh, uh, the dream catchers from the Red Indians. It's just new names. Remember Deuteronomy 32, verse 16 and 17, that says, new gods that came newly up. In those days, it was Ashtoreth, Chemosh, and Milcom. These days... It's the dream catcher, the fairies, the Spider-Mans, the Batmans, etc., etc., etc. And all the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. You see, people, these idols provokes our Lord to anger. He's our father. He does not want to be provoked to anger. He wants to love us and give us, us the best. Now, what did Josiah?